Hi there, and welcome to The D-Spot, a brand new vodcast and podcast series that boldly redefines dyslexia. We bring together inspirational educators, industry disruptors, and passionate change makers, many of whom are made by dyslexia. We reveal all there is to know about dyslexic thinking and why the world needs more of it right now. Inspiring, informative, surprising conversations set on creating change. So in this episode, uh, we're going to meet two amazing people people, and we're going to discuss how people people are great at empathy, leadership, seeing the big picture and solving problems. I'm so excited today to be able to welcome two amazing people who have used their dyslexic thinking skills to navigate um, through the global pandemic. Leading the NHS as it battles with the invisible en enemy of COVID and leading the church as it responds to the needs of a society that is struggling. Today we're joined by Bishop of London, Sarah Mullally, and Ruth May, the Chief Nursing Officer of the NHS. Welcome both of you. Hello. Can we kick off today um, by exploring your dyslexic strengths and how you think dyslexia has helped you um, in your job in general, but, but also specifically touching on um, the pandemic? If I can just uh, kick off with you, Sarah, um, just to give a bit of background, um, you are the church's third most senior leader. Uh, you're the first woman to become the Bishop of London. Uh, and you're also the former chief nursing officer. And for your role um, in, in that role, you received a damehood. And I believe you were also the youngest ever uh, uh, chief nursing officer. So there's a wonderful link to uh, what you do. And then also with uh, Ruth, who is the current chief uh, nursing officer. Um, Ruth, you started in January 2019, just before the pandemic, and I cannot believe a tougher time to, to actually get into that role. Um, and uh, also, I think you've, you've become very well known for your leadership and problem solving through such a tough time. So if we can start with you, Sarah, how do you think um, your dyslexic thinking helps you in what you do and has helped you in your career? Oh, well, I think, Kate, the first thing to say is I suspect that, um, like a lot of people, actually dyslexia felt like a bit of burden to begin with. I, you know, it took me a long time to be able to understand what, in a sense, my dyslexia thinking gave me. So, so the first thing is dyslexia has always given me a degree of rootedness and humility uh, because there's nothing like a spelling mistake to, uh, you know, ground you uh, in life. So, so there was always a sense of humility with it. Um, and also it meant that because I understood those things I didn't do quite as well, I, I compensated or I uh, put things in place to make sure it was safer for me. So I was very conscious of that. Uh, but I guess more recently, what I recognise is that I do have the ability to empathise with people. Um, I also have high emotional intelligence. I have the ability to look beyond the immediate um, to the broader sort of sense of what's going on. And, I, and looking at that, I think those are the things that have helped me, both in my leadership within nursing, but also my leadership within the church. Uh, and, um, and of course, that's some of the skills that people say and attribute to dyslexia. Um, so in the middle of the pandemic, that ability to look beyond the immediate anxiety uh, and to be able to see the, 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 the way in which we navigate, uh, particularly for the church, what, what, what was a difficult time. And I think that has helped a lot, but whether it's nursing or as a, as a priest, for me, people have always been central, you know, the care of the individual, loving our neighbor. Uh, and for me, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that empathy with people, I think has been at the heart of who I am, uh, which Kate, as you, you well recognize is something that's attributed to dyslexia thinking. Yes, absolutely. And Ruth, how about you? I guess I go back to um, Sarah's very first comments, which was, I didn't want to admit that I was dyslexic for, well, probably in just in the last five years, um, it was something of a stigma, it was something of a label. Um, so it took me a long time to realise, actually, it's my strength, it is who I am, and I am um, what I am, and people see that uh, I have different skills. I did bring different elements to a team because we're as good as our team. So I have a unique set of skills like somebody else has their unique set of skills. 
I first noticed I was dyslexic when people said that I was really good at listening and I was exceptionally good at questioning um, because I was overcompensating for not being able to read the long, long, long documents that comes with doing the job as Sarah knows, like we, mm-hmm. as Sarah's been doing, has been uh, as Chief Nursing Officer for England. So during the pandemic, though, uh, I think the strength has been my ability to connect, connect with the public when I'm wanting to uh, give some messages, connecting with the front line. And that being able to live in their shoes um, has been a real strength that has carried me through uh, this pandemic so far, because we're not yet over this pandemic. No, absolutely. But hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and Sarah, you actually have been leading um, the COVID response for the Church of England. That must have been a, a really big thing to take on. How, how have you navigated that and, and how do you think, um, again, how do you think dyslexia has helped in that? Uh, yeah, I mean, although it was a big thing, I, ha- I have to take my hat off to Ruth. I, mean, I think she's done an amazing job in the NHS. and I am so proud of what uh, nurses have done in the NHS. So, uh, you know, I, I often think, gosh, well, it is complex, but it's not as complex as Ruth, what Ruth has to do. So, so well done, Ruth, for all you're doing. I'm very grateful for that. Um, yeah, it is complex. And I think like, like Ruth was saying, um, we, um, I spend a lot of time listening um, I think she's right that what you do is you listen to people. So, so you, you, you know, you can have wonderful lots of papers and they're all really good, but you have to listen what's behind it. Um, and there's a lot of, there's been a, a lot of anxiety over the last year and particularly around how you, how do churches do what they do, which is about allowing a place for people to worship, but also providing compassionate care for their communities uh, and for stepping up and out into those communities at a time when we also want to prevent the risk of uh, COVID. And, and there is a lot of anxiety out there and, and experience in lots of ways. So the ability to, to listen and to empathize with people I think has helped and, and certainly in, in, a, in a room, so that at the moment in a Zoom room, so in a Zoom room, to not only hear what people are saying, but to listen to what they're saying and to get behind what they're saying helps in finding a way forward uh, that is uh, that, that gets a better outcome. And I think that's one of my observations about myself is the ability to listen to the room and to better understand what is what is going on. I mean, and the other, the other wonderful thing it gives you is the ability um, not only to listen, but to talk to people and to explain things and to empathize with them. Um, so for example, I, I very rarely do I ever uh, read a speech or read a sermon, you know, because of the fact is you trip up on it. So I've always either memorized it and spoken it because it's much more free, which allows you then to have a greater freedom to speak to people. So you are able to speak to groups of people to listen what they're saying and change your language so that they can better hear. And I think that has helped to try and, uh, reduce anxiety and in a sense, release the church to be what it is uh, to their communities. Uh, And for me, you know, in terms of representing the the love of God, but that's the ability to listen, to reassure and to release them. Yeah, and and obviously at at the moment with with people not being able to be with their loved ones and and all of the tragedy that we've heard, actually having all of those skills is is so, so vital. And I also think that it's interesting with reading the room, even using Zoom, um, if you've got your camera on, you you can interact with people and see how they respond and read their read their emotions and I think that's something we as dyslexics are, are very good at I hate using zoom without video without being able to see somebody because it's really really important to be able to do that yeah. and and Ruth in terms of uh, of you and the pandemic there's a there's a fantastic quote I read which was whatever COVID throws our way we seem to dig endlessly deeper to find solutions and strategies we need and I'm immensely proud of my nursing midwifery and care colleagues for this um, that's a very powerful quote. There's there's a lot of problem solving that you've had to apply during this period, isn't there? Uh, yeah, just as Sarah said as well, you know, I am immensely proud of all of the nurses from across the globe uh, who have really led the response for uh, COVID. You know, it doesn't matter which setting they've been in. You know, we've seen a lot of the television coverage being of a critical care 
But actually, there's been a lot of nursing input and leadership in mental health, in the homeless. There's been lots of nursing and midwifery and care input. So, but we've had lots of problems to deal with. This has been a very new virus. Um, we were all learning at the same time. And just seeing how people have worked as teams, particularly during these last three months when we've seen this enormous surge, bigger than wave one, when teams have had to come together, whether they're a doctor working as a healthcare assistant. Um, we saw some beautiful pictures of Bart's London's with the you know, professor of this and that working as a healthcare assistant on a night shift. And actually that has done enormous amount to say, actually we're in this together. And as a dyslexic person, I feel very much more connection with that. We're in this together and we're, we're in this to come together to serve um, and to serve the people that uh, are either within our doors or out of our doors, but we're here to be part of that health and care for the population of England. And you said something a moment ago, Kate, about there is light at the end of the tunnel. It is, you know, we've got the vaccination program and it feels very much of everybody's coming together. I vaccinate, I have the privilege to vaccinate on a Saturday morning at um, the Coaster Hospital or Coaster Football Stadium in the freezing cold, but the amount of smiling faces. Um, and it's been wonderful, it's just wonderful to see whole communities coming together uh, from all sorts of backgrounds, coming together and communicating. And even with a mask, you can read somebody's eyes, you can read somebody's smile, even behind the mask. Mm. Yeah, it is. It is fabulous, actually, if, if we can focus on the positive and all of the amazing things that are beginning to happen and what we've what we can learn from everything we've been through. And I think one thing that the, the world is really learning is how valuable people who are in caring professions are to us. And I think sometimes we, we probably take that for granted or have done. And I think suddenly that's that's really um, very much focused front and central for everybody. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we think about um, artificial intelligence and the way machines are actually going to be taking over a lot of, of the work that, that the, the public and people do at the moment, it is those sort of soft skills, the caring skills, the emotional intelligence, um, those sort of human ways of solving problems that are really so important um, in the future. So it, it would be very interesting to understand how you feel about where you think that the sort of machines are going to influence in, in where you both are in terms of your professions, technology and how, how we can enhance that or, or use that. What, do you have any impact on, on or thoughts on how that's impacting the church, Sarah? Gosh, well, you know, in terms of technology, I mean, we've seen, um, you know, if, if this time, uh, if this time sort of last year or even a couple of weeks before this, I'd asked the Church of England to go online for worship, they would have laughed at me. Um, and so technology has revolutionized the way in which the church is relating to their communities. You know, whilst the church places of worship buildings are open, some of them are open at the moment, most of them at the moment have been the buildings have been closed, but they've all been online. And, and so what they've learned is a connectivity with people uh, around it. But what I do recognize is that I do think that one of the things we've learned is the importance of human connectivity during this period of time. And so whilst people uh, are happy to relate through uh, technology, um, there is a des great desire to get back to meet each other. You know, the, long, the, the sense of wanting to hug people is enormous still. So. So I think technology has its place. And I think we've learned a lot about its role. And I think, you know, our behavior will change as a result of technology. Um, but I, however, think that what it, what it also shows is that fundamentally as humans, we want a connectivity with each other. We want to be with each other. We want to be present. And, and I think that's the importance that won't take away. And, and, and I think I have been struck, you know, by, uh, to watch the news clips on the pressure that the NHS was under was even in the midst of that pressure of all and all that PPE, that ability still to communicate presence by a nurse was still there, even if they couldn't do what they normally did. And I know a lot of nurses must have been frustrated. The ability, uh, as Ruth said, you know, that the, you can see a smile in the eyes um, and therefore that human connectivity, I don't think we will, uh, we will ever lose at all. And, and I think we've, 
you know, we've learned other things about how we work differently. And I was struck by Ruth's comment about the teams, the way the teams have worked differently. There's always been good teamwork in the NHS. But I think what I observed from the outside was, was some of those hierarchies just shifted. Mm. The fact that a you know, professor of surgery was willing to be a healthcare assistant just transformed um, that way of working. And I, so I do hope that those sort of things, you know, that the health service will, you know, having, having struggled to find that way of working, having found it in the middle of the pandemic, to take that forward, whatever the advances we see in technology, that, that human relationship working together will always be at the heart of our communities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also it's because we've had to do things at speed. It's enabled mm. us to actually really, as, as teams, focus in on what you're good at mm. and making sure you've got the best people mm. around you doing what you're good at, mm. which is perfect for, for dyslexics. Mm. But teamwork has been a massive part of that and folk pulling in the strength must be a massive part of your response to the pan pandemic, Ruth. Oh, absolutely. So if I just yeah, think about um, this time last year, if we said everybody would need or well, before 13 months ago, we said that, you know, everybody would have be having outpatients on, on Zoom or on Teams, or you could get to uh, a call with a general practitioner and Teams uh, just very quickly on a Zoom. You know, you'd never think it would really happen. We've been trying to do this for a while, but to do it overnight was just enormous. But we miss we missed people's yeah. connection. You can't do everything via teams you can't do everything via zoom um, and people people miss that but we've also seen some of our harder to reach um, people being able to access um, services via technology and feel much more comfortable with doing so so there's lots of things that we'll want to continue with um, as we hope that we'll soon get back to the new normal and um, for me though the teams bit will always stick in my memory was working uh, some shifts at the London Nightingale in the first wave. When I was working alongside physios, I was working alongside dentists, I was working alongside veterinary nurses, um, all coming together as one team. And as Sarah, as Sarah said, the hierarchy just went. Mm -hmm. And I do hope that uh, the new normal will not see that return. I, I, I'm sure we're, I'm sure as a world, we're going to take the positive out of what we've seen and the benefit of technology, but actually move forward. I think, I think it's been a big cult, a, a big shock for everybody, hasn't it? So I think we just need to work together to make sure that happens. Um, if I could just touch a little bit now on dyslexic challenges. Um, I know that Sarah, you had a, a very interesting point about when you were nursing, but it, it, I think you know we're all very focused on the strengths. But I think it's important to to touch on the challenges. Can you just um, tell me what you were thinking about that earlier? Mm. Well, it was, it was. I was just saying, Ruth. It was your bit about how, you know how how do you own up to having dyslexia? And I and in a sense, I only had a diagnosis of dyslexia because they wanted to give me more time in my exams at uh, O and A levels. Nothing. There was no sort of help or support given. And 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 I suppose I was always aware that I had to be careful about my spelling, careful about taking down telephone numbers or writing down results over the telephone. So I I knew what I had to. Um, uh, do uh, I never write on a flip? I never write on a flip chart. Always get somebody else to do it, those sort of things. But when we were in the Department of Health, I was I was um, I was reminded recently that there was a discussion about whether nurses could safely uh, be have have dyslexia. Could you have dyslexia and safely be a nurse? And I just I was fascinated, and it, and it related to drug calculations and, and of course you, you know actually I, I've never had a problems with maths I have, have a much more problem with writing things down so you know even now I can write down telephone number back to front very successfully and and so the, the fact is because I knew it I could compensate for it and I could uh, make um, you know I could compensate for it in that way and I think that's that's really important and 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 um, I was talking to somebody else on a reflection of dyslexia the real time I felt it the hardest was in fact in the church when I was in a cathedral and um, it was it was practice that you know you had to get the, all the words in the right order in a cathedral it didn't in a parish church you had greater flexibility and suddenly I realized that I hadn't been reading things I'd been looking at the shapes of things and occasionally I'd get them back to front it didn't matter but it did in a cathedral and um, and that suddenly became 
um, you know, a real challenge for me. So things like, uh, you know, it's no good me reading the order of service away from where I'm going to read. I have to see it on the paper so I can see the shape of it sitting on the paper. So even now, if I go to, uh, you know, I go to churches, new church every week, I'll always go in time. I'll read the service book where it is so I can see the shape of the paper and the words on it. You know, if I've got confirmation candidates, I can confirm something like 90 people in one go at St. Paul's Cathedral uh, pre-COVID. And so I have to have a system where the name is really clear to me. Um, so I get it right in that wonderful moment where I always say, God has called you by name, has made you his own. And in that, I have to get the name right, you know. And uh, so there are little systems I get in place. But but I even in the church, they often have the conversation about, you know, can you be a successful parish priest and have dyslexia? I just fascinate that what we focus on is what we don't get so right. I'm very focused on that. And so I could look after that. Other people don't. They could actually look at the bit about, you know, what, are the, what is the contribution I bring to the team that is different from other people in the team. I can almost guarantee most teams I work with, most of them can spell very well because they've all got PhDs and things. So that's great. But I've got bring other things uh, to the table. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I think if um, the, the EY reports that we did um, that look at dyslexic thinking skills and strengths, Steve Varley, the chairman of EY, comes up with a fantastic quote, which is you wouldn't employ superwoman and focus on how bad she is with kryptonite. And if you apply that to the nursing profession, where you have got these amazingly wonderful, empathetic, problem solving, fantastic dyslexic nurses and people wanting to become nurses who might be put off because there are little bits of their job that they may not do so well. Um, yet on the other hand, if, if you do need to check details, I think you probably check them much more than other people if you're dyslexic because you want to make sure you get it right. Would you agree with that, Ruth? Yeah, absolutely. I was laughing when Sarah was saying that. I'm just, <laughs> I was thinking uh, a couple of years ago, I read um, a reading uh, at Westminster Abbey with um, Sarah's part of Nurses' Day, celebration of Nurses' Day, and I particularly chose the shortest possible uh, reading <laughs> just so that I was I didn't trip up I had less uh, um, opportunity to trip up on my words um, but I've, I, I've, I've got um, five people reporting it to me I think directly and three of them have got PhDs so I fill the people fill my team with people that I don't the skills I don't have um, and that's what leaders do uh, which is to work that through but I think people with a dyslexic challenge have the ability to see that they need to do that more. Mm. And therefore we've often got stronger teams because we recruit people that have got, that fill our gaps rather than people like us uh, or more often. And then the biggest challenge, and it's still a challenge for me is when a, a, a set of papers comes my way and it's only an hour to read them. And I'm like, oh God, this is gonna take me three hours, not one hour. Uh, and I find that so tough. So I've I put in different systems where I have somebody in my team that reads them for me and I work them through with them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you look at my diary, it's full of very short meetings just for me to understand what this is really and what this is saying. And actually, even if I'd read the paper and even if I read the whole lot, it's the questioning what's behind it mm -hmm. that I really get to understand. So there are still challenges. There are, and there are sometimes it's really frustrating when uh, you haven't got time to read the paper in the, the, in the time and the detail in the way that you want, but you have to put in other coping strategies. And now people just say, oh, well, she hasn't read that paper. <laughs> you know, my boss, Simon, he's worked out which paper I haven't read because um, <laughs> I asked the question, but that's life, that's me, I'm unique. <laughs> Absolutely. And it is about focusing on our strengths and actually owning up to the fact that we find these things challenging. So we need help with them and, and, and therefore using really using your strengths. But I, um, sorry, Kate, but I do think just on that last point, Ruth, I do, I do think that bit about asking the questions um, often I do think it gets behind the paper, whereas actually if, if if the questions aren't asked, we often don't find that bit behind. So even if even if it's, you know, uh, even if your boss thinks it's, you know, uh, he, in a sense, it's spotting that you haven't read. Actually, often it's the questions are more important sometimes than the paper. You know, yeah. I think there is a risk 
there is a risk in both worlds where where there are lots of bright people where words are important that actually they use the words in the paper to avoid what the real question is and I think that's something we can bring. And I think also there's an awful lot more support around. So when I was doing my O-levels, A-levels, it was still a stigma for where I was from. Whereas right now, uh, I've been really impressed by how much support Mm. my employers have given me. Mm. Um, And it's like, that's you? Fine, let's find a way of what is it we can do to support you? And that has been a revelation. I just wish I'd... I wish I knew about that before. Or or more to the point, I wish I had the confidence to, to ask for it before. But since I've asked for it, I've had absolutely loads of support to help me, which has been such a welcome thing. Yeah, it's amazing advice for everybody, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So I, um, just in closing now, um, if, if our mission as a charity is to help the world to understand dyslexia, to redefine it so people understand the strengths. If there was one thing that you could um, change about dyslexia, or actually if there's one thing you wanted the world to know, what would that be? And Sarah, if I can start with you on that. You know, at, at, the, heart of, at the heart of the Christian faith is the belief that um, each one of us are made individually by God and we're made in his image. And I suppose the bit for me is to understand, is for, the, for us as individuals, but also the world, to see that actually we are all unique. Uh, and therefore some of that means dyslexia for others it's other but we're all unique and therefore of value and I think for me that sense of being made in the image of God all of us unique special beloved um, is I think that for me um, in a sense if we could if the world could see that it would change I think the way not just dyslexia was perceived but a whole series of other things yeah a hundred percent Ruth I think uh, having people that's got a dyslexia is a strength to any team from any background. Now to have a whole team of people like me would be, wouldn't be, wouldn't be successful, but to have a whole group of people of different strengths, different backgrounds, but including somebody that's got dyslexia, I think uh, adds a strength to any team. Fantastic. That's an amazing, um, amazing thought to, to end on from both of you. I'm, I'm sad we didn't have more time because I'm sure we could have chatted for ages. But thank you so much. And I hope that anybody who hears this will be really inspired by your messages. Thank you very much indeed.